now we're thinking about the person who's kind of borderline is listening to all of this and perhaps thinking, like you said earlier, like first line, think about your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, nutrition, sleep, exercise, these things come to mind, supplementation. Um, what can we do to kind of nudge ourselves up to a healthier, more optimized level of testosterone? So yeah. if we start with nutrition, in what ways, if at all, do our food choices affect our testosterone levels? I think they do specifically in the micronutrients, probably more than anything, because as we just talked about, you need cholesterol to produce, but we can make cholesterol ourselves. But micronutrients are very essential, you know, so zinc, magnesium, selenium, vitamin K, vitamin D, all of these micronutrients are probably very important. A lot of people have a micronutrient void diet. So I would start first with really trying to get in your micros. I usually recommend like chronometer and then, you know, have certain ranges that I tell guys to put in and try to hit those. And if you need supplementation, you can do that. The actual macronutrient or the food choice, in my opinion, doesn't argue. I mean, there will be people on either side of the aisle that are going to argue, you know, that no animal foods will boost it and no plant foods, you know, high carb, low carb. Yeah. And I, I don't think there's good data. You know, I've looked all over and like we said, there's a study to support one thing and a study to support another. So I don't think it matters that much at the end of the day. I think the most important thing that you should do is get enough calories in first and foremost, get enough protein in first and foremost, and then, you know, get those macros or micros dialed in. So you say calories, does, does energy restriction being in a calorie deficit, does that affect testosterone levels absolutely yeah so you see a lot of the natural bodybuilding guys who get you know bone dry like super low fat and they have very low uh, calories their levels will be like damn near zero they get so low it makes a lot of sense you know you're from an evolutionary standpoint you're probably not in a good place to reproduce um, if you don't have the calories essential to be a good provider kind of so, similar to a, a, a woman yeah. who's over exercising under fueling and um, develops amenorrhea 100 percent. yeah i saw a, a marathon runner recently who did like these back-to-back marathons and his testosterone was like double digits just awful he felt terrible so we just get him back on a good nutrition and back off the exercise and it'll usually go back up that's interesting because at least what i've read so the flip side of that is the calorie surplus being overweight and obese and i believe they're associated with low testosterone Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Like everything, too low, <laughs> too high, not good. Um, so yeah, that this is the this is a more um, common of thing is you know energy toxicity essentially through a lot of pathways. One of which being insulin. Very high levels of insulin is actually kind of inflammatory and disrupts the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So we can have insulin resistance occurring in the hypothalamus first. And there's some papers that say that insulin resistance starts in the brain, um, which is very interesting. And one of those is that it reduces LH and FSH output. And then there's higher levels of inflammation. Adipose tissue is very inflammatory in nature. You know, it produces uses these cytokines because our fat can only store our fat cells can only store so much fat they kind of get you know pushed to the brim and they exude these these uh, inflammatory molecules which drive inflammation inflammation can disrupt the hypothalamus and pituitary but can also affect the testes so when you're trying to get a guy fertile you actually try to reduce inflammation as much as possible try to make them as insulin sensitive as possible because that stuff can have an effect on sperm count too so yeah the the more common of the scenario is energy toxicity adiposity driving hypogonadism right so getting to a a healthy body weight good body composition is going to be important for testosterone absolutely what's the relationship between protein intake and testosterone i'm not i don't know if i have seen any like i'm sure they're out there but i don't know I just, uh, not usually an issue that I, I'm always telling guys to get enough protein. I'm sure if you have too little protein, you're going to have an inability to produce, you know, the required hormones, but I can't cite any studies or anything. I would just say, I would probably put money on the fact that if you have too little protein, your hormones will be impacted. Mm-hmm. Is skeletal muscle or having enough skeletal muscle, is that important at all for testosterone production? I can't think of anything in that regard either that, you know, a more muscled person produces more or less testosterone. I don't think that's out there. I don't see why it wouldn't matter too much. It's hard to say. What about, yeah, what about like, saturated fats? Oh yeah. That's so a good if we one. flip, yeah, well, let's, let's move to another macro fats. There is a lot of, uh, discussion on social media, um, TikTok, shorts on YouTube of people saying, uh, foods like eggs, 
or butter are particularly good for raising testosterone because they um, are either rich in saturated fats and or dietary cholesterol. Yeah, again, I think that's flawed in that you are just looking at the mechanism and thinking cholesterol comes first. So anything that increases cholesterol is going to increase testosterone. It doesn't necessarily play out that way. There's one study that was quoted, I think, by a prominent science figure and gets, you know, put on shorts and reels and everything where eating eggs increased the testosterone. They, they had two arms of that. One was eating eggs, one was eating egg whites. I think there's way too much variability in that, first and foremost. Eggs are pr egg whites are pretty much just protein. They're devoid of a lot of the micronutrients. So there's too many confounding variables in there. Was it the choline? Was it the other micronutrients that were in the egg, the selenium? You know, what was it there? Was it just a saturated fat and the cholesterol? Maybe. But then conversely, you know, we see studies where higher saturated fat diets are correlated with lower levels of testosterone. So it's too tough, in my opinion, to tease out the data because it's all over the place. And I, I don't like those bold claims like you need to eat high saturated fat in order to have testosterone because I can find a study that says the exact opposite. Is it true, though, that you do need to have some amount of fat in your diet to support testosterone production? Um, is there potentially an issue if someone adopts a very just total, like a very low total fat diet? It's low in saturated fats. It's low in unsaturated fats. I'm I thinking think, of like the the 10 fat vegan yeah. diet that's often promoted. I think you would have to definitely. I think some of the concern with too low a fat diet is that you're not getting enough of the. Um, the fat soluble micronutrients. So if you controlled for that, I don't know, that would be a good study that if you, you just reduce fat, but then supplemented with D A E K things like that, do you still have it? Cause I don't know. I don't think that study exists. I think in general, we shouldn't be too dogmatic and should have a, a good amount of carbs, fats and, and proteins, you know? Uh, but I don't know of any study that says that a fat free diet is correlated with lower. And if it is, is that because of the fat itself or the nutrients that usually come alongside mm. the fat? Yeah, that's a good point. Have you seen either in studies or with people that you've worked with, like how much can someone increase their testosterone by, by changing lifestyle? By living? like, for example, in this context, if someone is not at a healthy body weight, they lose weight, become more insulin sensitive. What percentage increase in testosterone might they see? Yeah, really good study on this recently, 2023 Andrology, I believe. Um, they they took guys, the obese guys, basically had them lose weight. And I forget the, I can't remember all of the the references, but one of them, taking your, your adiposity from one range and bringing it down to another, there was a 40% increase in testosterone. So these were obese to non-obese. I don't know the exact body fat percentage, but 40% is big. significant. Yeah. Especially when, you know, you're looking at these testosterone boosters and things that people are claiming 10% increase. So great. I'm taking my 600 and making it 660. You know, these people are having a 40% increase. That's pretty robust. Yeah. Especially if it takes them from below like the low end of normal or below that into the normal range, right? right? Yeah. Um, is there anything else that we need to cover here with regards to nutrition and testosterone? Nutrition, hard to say. That one's, that one's heated. You know, we'll get the most comments on that. No matter what we say, we're going to piss somebody off in the field. But I think in nutrition, the biggest thing is focus on your micronutrients, get enough protein, get enough fat for you, whatever that is. It's hard to say. So nutrition's a weird, I don't know. It's hard. I would say minimize, eat more whole foods, micronutrient, micronutrient dense foods is going to be the best way to go. Um, but in lifestyle in general, I would say sleep is huge, definitely overlooked. Um, psychological health is really big and something that I really try to work with people on both psychological and spiritual health, because all of these things will skew your levels really significantly. So when people weren't dialed in, if they're not, I tell them like, we need to check off every box. And I mean, really check off every box. A lot of people say, I'm good, you know, I'm good, but they're not, you know, their diet's not good. And they're telling me they're good, but I'm like, dude, I can see you're insulin resistant. Like your diet is not good. We need to work on this. We need to check off all these boxes before ever thinking about testosterone. Where it becomes difficult is there are guys who have tried everything and they're hitting a wall because their levels are so low. And what do you do with that guy who doesn't have the motivation, the drive to get up off the couch and do the work needed because his testosterone is so low? In my opinion, I think that's something where an intermediate like in clomiphene for a short period of time can be really good. Or maybe they do need TRT. It's hard. It's really hard. It's a tough discussion. Right. Just to get the wheels in motion. Exactly. Mm. You mentioned sleep. 
is there an optimal amount of sleep? Is it the, the time, the duration that someone's getting every night? Is it sleep quality? All there's the studies above, that have looked at this and, and sort of tried to tease out what's most important when it comes to our sleep behaviors and testosterone. All the above, I think the, the time, the duration, the time you go to sleep seems interesting for hormones, not so much testosterone, but growth hormone. Uh, I think you had Kristen Holmes on, right? Is that her name? Kristen? No. Wait, what's her name? Okay. You were on hers on the Whoop podcast. Yes. Is there, yeah. It, I talked to her one day. She, she enlightened <laughs> me on this, uh, this growth hormone um, production occurs at like 11 p.m. in everybody. And if you miss that window, then your growth hormone doesn't get produced. So, you know, if you go to bed at 11, you may be missing that growth hormone output. So she was talking about the importance of actual timing, which I thought was very interesting. I'm not a sleep specialist, but it does seem like the time we go to bed makes sense. Probably when the sun goes down, we should go to sleep and when the sun comes up we should wake up that's probably when we're going to produce the most amount of uh testosterone yeah i i confused you there because she interviewed me yeah but we put that up on my channel right <laughs> <laughs> i saw that come through uh what about resistance training does lifting weights does that affect testosterone levels in any way there's this kind of idea out there at least when i was in my 20s mm -hmm. everyone would say don't skip leg day when right. you train legs and you train legs hard it will increase testosterone and probably so i think it does it's always hard to tease out whether it's just this transient spike you know uh, because acute effects are much different than chronic effects. So is it an acute an effect and does it have any bearing on the rest of the day and the year, et cetera? Hard to say. Growth hormones that same way. Then you're getting the increase in growth hormone IGF-1 acutely, not really necessarily long term. But I think in general, it's a good recommendation to do some resistance training. You probably will have optimal hormones if you do. What about testosterone levels over the course of a day? When hmm. we wake up, are our testosterone levels the highest for the day and then they gradually go down or what does it look like across a day and does that affect when we are strongest and therefore um, the time of the day where we can perhaps get the best workout in possibly yeah i mean to answer the first question it's producing what's called a diurnal rhythm so that means the most of the testosterone is produced right when we wake up so you'll have the highest number when you wake up which is also the best time to get tested I think, I think you could make an argument for the opposite too, because you might want to see it when it's at its lowest, but your uh, endocrinology usually says test first thing in the morning, because that's when it will be its highest. By the end of the day, it does fall off. As to whether or not that impacts um, your response to resistance training, I've seen papers that say both. So I think again, it comes down to individual variability. If you generally feel more energized and you feel better with more meals than you at the end of the day, you're probably gonna have a better workout than you do first thing in the morning. And I don't think that the testosterone fluctuations within a normal uh, physiologic range are gonna have that much bearing on your, your hypertrophy, which is the argument against a lot of the testosterone boosting supplements. You know, like I said, if we're doing a 10% increase, you're bringing it to 60 to, six, or to 660, that's the clinically insignificant. You know, when we're talking about testosterone, having these massive hypertrophic benefits, we're talking about super physiologic. We're taking that 600 and making it 2000. Right. Testosterone boosting supplements. You went there. So let's, right, let's, let's do double it. click yeah. on this. Um, what are we talking about here? What kind of compounds? So the ones that have gained the most popularity again through an influential, you know, science, uh, social media figure would be, um, Fidoja and Tonkat Ali. Um, those are probably the most, there was Tribulus for a while when I was coming up. Yes, everybody talked about that. Tribulus yeah. was like when in, in my twenties, that was the big right. one. Everybody talked about that. I don't know what happened to it. I don't even know the mechanism of action. <laughs> <laughs> no one talks about Tribulus anymore, but it's yeah. now, uh, you know, Tonkatali, Fidoja, and then to an extent Boron, uh, because Boron can have a suppressive effect on SHBG and potentially increase the free. I haven't seen good data on either one of those. It's hard. I mean, I have seen guys have come in with very high LH. on Fedosia and Tonkat, yeah, Ali, which are they're extracts from herbs. Yes, so they are. yeah. yeah. Um, and the Fedosia, I don't think we fully understand the mechanism. I think we know kind of it's going to increase LH and FSH because it can really only work one way. It can only increase LH and FSH or reduce SHBG or be a LH mimetic and stimulate the testes. So it can work in three different ways, I guess. But it seems like Fedosia probably increases LH and FSH. I haven't seen good data on it. I think the only study that everybody bat, like, you know, puts their hat on is that there was a five-day rat study, I believe. It's called aphrodisiac effects of 
Fidosia and, and they increase the testosterone. And then there's another study that luckily does get cited where they talk about testicular toxicity that occurred. It was at high doses and again in rodents, but. But the question there is, is it metabolized the same way right. in Who humans? Yeah. And how do you take the dosage from that study and sort of extrapolate um, that to, to humans? Yeah. And so there's no human data that you know of that, that looks at safety? Fidosia? No, not that I have found. Interesting. Yeah, but Tonkat Ali does seem to have some pretty good studies. Um, I know one time we were talking, you sent me one. That was a really good study done with um, the four arms. I don't know if remember that. So I think they had like a control group. They had a group that was taking Tonkat and exercising. And then, but it was interesting because at the end of it, it seemed like they only got an increase if they were exercising. Right which they didn't do an exercise only group, which I wish they had that as an arm because that would tell us, was it just the exercise that increased the yeah. testosterone? And what was it like a 10%? Yeah, it was 10%. Yeah, so again, so insignificant in my opinion, I would not waste my money on the 10% increase in testosterone. It's okay. never gonna be enough to feel it. Okay.